grandma has this dress. No. Neither. I feel like Harry Potter. Too librarian. Too Bono? No. 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 Big no. Yes. I look a little bit like a bumblebee. How long you been in these parts? Blah. If sadness had a color. I bought this? Your Honor, I object. Hmm? No. This is so much like my dad. That is the ticket.
Support for KQED Live comes from Berkeley Rep. Support for KQED comes from the Asian Art Museum. Visitors can step into an experience like no other at Team Lab Continuity and become part of a wondrous ecosystem of lush natural imagery that dynamically evolves around them. For more information and ticket reservations, visit AsianArt.org. The disproportionate impact of more than half of black business owners. And disproportionate. Somehow we always find a way Welcome to back. rise. To the blueprint builders. 
to the backbones of every block, for the curators of the culture, and for generations to follow. You might fall, but never fail. Keep rising, keep rising, keep rising. Apply for business, marketing, and tech makeovers on us. So glad I'm flying out of Oakland today. Let's count the reasons why. For one, flying locally reduces my carbon footprint. Plus, my airport supports over 17,000 jobs in the East Bay. And it makes sense. The more I fly from OAK, the more flights airlines will add out of OAK. All good. No matter where you live in the Bay Area, there are many great reasons to pick OAK and fly the East Bay way. What you do with that extra hour is up to you. everybody and welcome to KQD Live at the Commons here in our studio headquarters in San Francisco. I'm Holly Kernan. I'm our Chief Content Officer here at KQED and I am so thrilled to see you all here for tonight's event with two brilliant local minds. Writer and Professor Emerita of Sociology at UC Berkeley, Arlie Hochschild, and her husband Adam Hochschild, author, journalist, historian, and co-founder of Mother Jones, among other accomplishments. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that KQED headquarters are located on Ramatush Ohlone stolen land. And we recognize that we benefit from living and working here, and that we owe a collective debt to its original you know, occupants. Uh, so tonight, we gather here for KQED Live, our multi-platform event series dedicated to bringing journalism to life on stage, amplifying local cultures, building community. Uh, through live storytelling, conversations, screening, and performances, we bring people together to explore questions about the common good and to appreciate what makes the Bay Area special. So you can find out all about our events at kqed.org slash live. And we want to recognize the sponsors that make KQED Live's programming possible, Asian Art Museum, Berkeley Rep, Comcast Business, and Oakland International Airport. We are so grateful for their commitment to supporting our mission of civic and cultural engagement in the Bay Area. And we want to thank all of you for being with us tonight and for engaging with KQED on the radio at 88.5 FM, on television or streaming online, on your podcast feeds or at kqd.org. And if we bring value to your everyday life, I want to encourage you to consider becoming a KQED member. You can find out about how to do that at kqed.org slash donate. Tonight, we welcome your questions. On your way in, you received cards and pencils, so please write down any questions or comments for response, and the KQED team members will come around and collect them from you. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce our host this evening. Not only is he an illustrious broadcaster, having helmed KQED's flagship public affairs program for nearly three decades. He's also an esteemed academic and critic, professor of English at San Francisco State Emeritus, um, and he himself is the author of numerous books. So please join me in welcoming Michael Krasny. <laughs> He'll be here in a second. And his guests tonight, Arlie and Adam Hochschild. Well, welcome. Let me first of all thank Holly and just a quick footnote, but an important one. Uh, Holly Kernan is now our content, uh, that is KQED's content head, and uh, she was at one time a producer of Forum going way back. And Michael Issop came to me at one point and said, um, you knew Holly, you worked with her, and uh, she's applying for an executive position and she's in the final running. What's your, what are your thoughts? And I said, my thoughts are very simple. Uh, it would be a terrible mistake if you didn't hire her. And if you do hire her, you will always be grateful for me saying that you should hire her. <laughs> and on that note, let me say how grateful I am to be here, for all of you who are here tonight, despite the fact that we still have a pandemic. And uh, hope no variants will continue to arise. 
Uh, and it's a pleasure to, to be with Arlie and Adam, whom I've known for a number of years. And uh, in fact, Adam and I go back to his first book in 1986, which was a memoir about well, his relationship with his father in South Africa. It was a very eloquent and moving memoir. Um, but both of them are really outstanding um, in so many ways. I mean, they're gifted writers, they're hardworking writers, and they're probably, as I've said, and I don't necessarily, some many of you know this, uh, have a tropism toward hyperbole, um, but I've said that they're two of our best nonfiction writers, and I mean that in all sincerity. Um, they've given us so much, and I'm grateful for all the education they provided for me. There's an old joke that used to come to my mind that Adam wrote about an exposed fascist, and Arlie interviewed a lot of them, but um, we'll talk about all that, and we'll talk about more uh, in the course of this evening. Uh, Arlie, of course, is also famous for, for not only a book about and I'm using the word fascist advisedly here and jokingly, but talking to blue-collar workers um, who were very, shall we say, um, angry at the left and at the Democratic Party and very much on the Trump bandwagon. And she really wanted to understand and empathize with who they were and how they came to be ideologically where they were. Um, she's also written some very important work on women and work and uh, is known for particularly a book called The Second Shift, but she's written many other books and published many articles in addition to that. Adam uh, has a really amazing track record, like Arlie, in terms of publications. Many of you know him from King Leopold's Ghost, which is probably the best book that's ever been written on the Congo in modern times. But he's also written about the Spanish Civil War, and he's written about World War I, and he just published a book recently uh, uh, about uh, a, a couple that many people don't know about, a Jewish woman who married a, what we, I suppose we could describe as a very wasp patrician uh, wealthy man, and she was a woman who was very impoverished. It's a, it's a book that I think uh, really needs to be read more. It kind of, we'll talk about it a bit too, uh, went kind of under the radar during the pandemic. But there's lots I want to talk with them about this evening, particularly with their work and with the fact that, you know, they've been a married couple for over a half a century and have built a life together and um, how do they work together and what drives them and we'll get into all that and more. But we decided that we wanted to begin by talking about Ukraine because Ukraine is very much on all of our minds and the reality now that we are well, uh, well aware of, all too well aware of, is a grim one. Uh, Adam also wrote a book about Russia and uh, I think understands Stalin perhaps more than most. Um, I was telling them earlier that Fiona Hill has an interview in a new issue of Politico where she talks about Putin and she knows Putin uh, and she's really a very eminent historian. She says Putin is perfectly capable of using nuclear weapons. And Arlie understands Putin in ways that probably most of us don't think about Putin. Um, she's done a lot of work on emotional labor and how emotions affect people and just the sense of Putin turning himself into a stone. But let me actually begin, Adam, with you. Uh, get your assessment particularly, because I, I am thinking a lot about Stalin, except that Stalin with noose, maybe. Yeah. Um, <coughs> or, or thinking about someone who wants to be a czar and all of that kind of armchair psychoanalysis that we do of Putin, nevertheless, what do we do about this? I mean, you know, it's like the Blitzkrieg or it's like Sudetenland. It's, you know, history all over again, yeah. but with nuclear weapons looming. I don't have the solution, unfortunately, <laughs> for what we do. I think all of us, you know, are reading and seeing and listening to the news from Ukraine and our hearts go out to those people. Uh, their resistance has been amazing, has been extraordinary. Uh, Putin seems determined uh, to conquer the country, and I fear he's not going to stop. Uh, he's someone who has always thought in terms of <clears throat> expanding the footprint of the diminished Russia that came out of the uh, fragmentation of the Soviet Union. Uh, it's backed up by theory, his favorite intellectual is a man named Ivan Ilyin, who was an out-and-out -out fascist, an admirer of, of Mussolini and Franco, 
uh, who preaches the virtue of the strong man deciding things for the country. And that's the, that's how Putin thinks. But as you say, he's a czar and he's a czar with nukes. Exactly how you handle that, I don't know, but I think the Ukrainians have surprised everybody by their enormous and creative resistance. One has to hope that this is going to create a big backlash in Russia. Uh, there are certainly signs of some of that happening, but I fear that it's not going to happen fast enough. Uh, we had such hope for Russia when we were living there 30 years ago. Yeah. We lived there for six months, uh, but it's gone such a, a different and nastier direction since then. Yeah, you have to lament and wonder what happened to Perestroika and what happened to Glasnost. Uh, um, Memorial Arlie, movement. You see, student, you see Putin from a perspective of trying to make himself like a stone. Uh, talk about that. I mean, just the emotional nature of what he has had to do to himself. You always have that picture of him at a table with all of his advisors way down at the yeah, other end. A huge know. table. Yeah. Well, I, I'm no expert in, in Putin, and it's just conversational. But, <laughs> um, but um, some of the conversations we have are. What is he really like? Will all this American pressure that's being put on uh, kind of uh, oil and all of uh, our companies that are withdrawing and uh, locking down banks, is that going to backfire? What kind of a guy is he? And I feel like in some of the interviews I've done on the really hard right, there is a stance of injured pride. You know, you're proud and but someone has hurt your pride. And that is a kind of the most electricity <laughs> and, uh, that I worry about, that I, I seek to know the, the origin of. And I see it in him. I mean, it's not just, you know, decades of being in the KGB and the ruthless things. He's ordering these poisonings of, of, of opponents uh, that are normal in that world. But I think if he's getting, I do worry about a backfire with him. The more pressure we put on, the more he cannot stand the shame of you know, being brought down. If you're injured in your pride, that's the last thing you can stand. And the more pressure, the more uh, he will feel that. I don't think it's a reason not to do it, but we, we have to be mindful of it. But what I meant about the stone is simply there is, I think, for a, let's say, a sociopathic person, um, not all of that is natural. You have to kind of keep it going. <laughs> and I think one way is to surround yourself with yes men and um, control your environment so that you don't feel. I remember Himmler um, was saying to all his Nazi uh, colleagues, all of you have one Jewish friend. You can't afford that anymore. You know, what do they have to do to not feel? That's well, I'm struck. For some reason, by the subtitle of your book about anger and mourning. I mean, you're talking about anger, but it's almost as if Putin also is mourning a lost Russia mm -hmm. and wants to believe, I mean, supposedly that statement he made about the greatest catastrophe of the 20th century was a breakup of the USSR keeps coming back to haunt me, Yeah. thinking, is he trying to move from here as Zelensky says, on to Latvia, on to Estonia, yep. sure. on to Lithuania, on to Poland and Romania and so forth, and, and the Baltics. And the answer yeah. seems to be maybe unequivocally yes. You know, the interesting thing is that um, social psychologists have compared the emotional effect of deprivation with one of, which means you want something and you don't have it. That's one story. But the other is you had it and you lost it. And that's the one we have to watch out for. I think that's the one that can get elaborated. And I think on the American right, a sense of loss um, and uh, mourning 
has been I mean, moved to a new chapter of aggrievement and loss is turned into stolen. Now, someone took what I had. Um, that's, <laughs> that's a blame. So, um, yeah. And someone with a good deal of sagacity said that many of those on the right now, their politics are based on wanting to give their middle finger to those on the left. I mean, we've never been, I mean, it's a cliche, but we've never been so polarized. I wonder, Adam, how you see things now. We'll get domestic for a moment uh, with all this polarization. I mean, um, well, first of all, what do you, I'm not asking you to read tea leaves here or anything, but you know, a lot of what we're hearing from the right is this wouldn't have happened under Trump. Oh, yeah. Trump was able to put Putin in his place, or yeah. Trump was able to have a friendship with Putin that was very distinct and unique and so forth. Are we going to see a revival? I mean, the, the Republicans are saying uh, DeSantis is at maybe 20%, but most of them, it's Trump's party. Most of them want Trump to be the next nominee. I can't help but feel that Trump has lost ground a great deal, especially since the invasion of, of Ukraine. I agree with and that. I think his, the videos of him and Putin at Helsinki, uh, other nice things that he has said about Putin, they will come back to haunt him. And of course, I welcome any divisions <laughs> in their ranks. And I think right now there's a lot over how to, how to feel about Putin. So I welcome that. <laughs> How did, uh, Arlie, I'm kind of curious to know how, when, when you wrote the book, uh, and you're working now in the Ozarks uh, with uh, uh, people of different backgrounds, uh, geographically and probably culturally, but still people who feel very alienated from the federal government and angry about so many things, but particularly one has to look at some things that are going to be central to the next election, uh, and I'm talking about critical race theory, I'm talking about immigration, and, um, you know, you can add many more to that list, uh, police defunding and so forth. But I, is there, from your perspective, especially since you really got into these people's hearts and minds, a way for them to recognize what might be in their best interest? <laughs> or, uh, no, I mean that seriously because yeah, do too. so many of them don't really. Right? I and I don't mean that even in partisan politics. I mean, they're just that anger again. They like about Trump what we don't like about Trump. They think, well, we, we've given up on the government, the state, that all the goodies are going to other people and not us. And by us, I mean blue-collar, high school-educated, white, uh, middle-aged, rural uh, group. And uh, so they feel like uh, what we need is a big personality that's kind of as big as a state. And we think, oh, narcissism, oh my God. And they think, good, yeah, it needs to make up in personality what, uh, what we're not getting from the government. Um, so, uh, and they like about him his shamelessness. I think if we look at the newspapers when he was president, there were kind of three little moments. One moment he would say something shameful. Oh, all immigrants are uh, rapists. Yeah, that would be moment one. Moment two, the punditry says, you can't say that. That's shameful. That's terrible. Yeah, I mean, you're the president. How can you do that? And uh, moment three, he rails against the shamers. Oh, you uh, treasonous press, and you know the deep state and the Democratic Party, and um, so he gives them an enemy. He turns that morning <laughs> um, sideways and uh, weaponizes it. But it, there are things we don't like that they do. But um, purpose of my work is simply to make it. I'm not a reporter. I'm trying to listen in on how they see the world and report on that as a diagnostic going forward as we. Did you make get our way. Um, a lot of flack from your fellow um, left warriors, so to speak, uh, about you know trying to be so empathic and? Oh sure, yeah. Um, 
it's, um, there, I had a funny experience, actually, after the book came out. Um, I was invited to give a talk at Louisiana State University uh, Honors College, and I thought, oh boy, I've <laughs> really said some tough things about this oil state that's uh, Louisiana and uh, how it uh, is uh, its own worst enemy. And so I prepared my talk really carefully. I was nervous. Well, I got there and they said, and they loved it. They said, look, you're not telling us anything new. We have to roll up our sleeves and uh, um, uh, uh, it, they liked it. But then I gave the very, then I was also invited to a, um, give a talk at Pomona College. It's a wonderful college on the, um, West Coast, very liberal, and I thought, I don't have to prepare anything. This is speaking to the choir, no problem. Well, no, uh, they thought, you want us to talk to those racists, you know, the uh, hillbillies, those rednecks? So, uh, you know, and empathy is a fool's errand, and, uh, you know, a uh, sign of weakness, so I got that whole rap there. And then I backed up and thought, well, what's going on? You know, why is this sort of the, the boundary of this moral bubble getting tighter? And why are people, you know, the politics is, is a matter of kind of blaming and shaming within a, a bubble. And there's a kind of a fear and a downward mobility that I think a lot of kids in academia feel. So they're feeling a kind of like strangers in a, their own land, too. Yeah. Well, how do you assess, Adam, I mean, as someone who has long been committed to the left, um, I mean, co-founder of Mother Jones, uh, you've got that pedigree, and uh, I know you're proud of it. Um, where Where is the left headed in all this? Uh, or what's your hopes for the left? Um, and maybe say something about the woke movement, because a lot of the left is now seen in those terms. Mm -hmm. Well, I do see a lot of positive things on the, you know, in, in terms of progressive politics. I'm delighted, for example, by how much climate is part of Biden's agenda. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is something we haven't seen before. This is something that the left has been pushing for hard for years. We should all be for it. It shouldn't be a left-right issue. Mm -hmm. You know, this world is going to fry if we don't do something about it. Uh, that's, that's on the table in a big way in American politics nationally in a way that it wasn't before. I think, you know, medical care for all is on the table, even though we haven't achieved it yet, in a way that it wasn't before. And I think those of us on the progressive side of things should take credit for those things. Um, you're right to worry about wokeism. Uh, there is an awful lot of excesses of political correctness here and there. Every university campus in the country, every progressive institution, every environmental organization has gone through some sort of upheaval in the last year, year or two. Um, and I understand it this way, I think. I, I think actually the person who expressed this best was our friend Todd Gitlin, who sadly died several weeks ago, who said in something he wrote uh, uh, 20, 25 years ago, said, you know, the right is systematically taking over city councils and school boards what is the left taking over? The English department. <laughs> uh, and I think what happens is here we are in a country right now where a lot of people uh, on college campuses, which is where you know, I'm seeing it most, feel enormously frustrating, frustrated. The pandemic is hugely frustrating. Uh, job prospects uh, for young people, even graduating from colleges, even graduating from prestigious colleges, 
are not as secure as they used to be. There's a high level of frustration. Uh, and then the political situation, you know, George Floyd is murdered on video for the whole world to see, and very few changes in police departments have been made since then. Trump is almost reelected and is still sort of hover, his shadow is hovering over us. There's a high level of frustration. People take it out on whatever is the nearest target, which, you know, if you're on a college campus, it's that college. And I see this happening again and again, and I want to direct people's energy outward, uh, which is a hard thing to do because it means reaching across that political divide that Arlie chronicled so well in Strangers in Their Own Land, learning how to talk to people who have a very different take on the world than you do. It's so much easier to talk to people who have the same general take on the world that you do and whom you can whip up into feeling that your English department or whatever, you know, the particular institution you're in isn't being politically correct enough. Uh, reaching across those lines, learning how to put the ideals we have into words and metaphors that appeal to a wide range of people is much harder to do. If we could only channel, uh, find ways, you know, to sublimate a lot of what you've just yeah. described. Um, I always used to hold out the ideal or the possibility of good citizenship and really mm -hmm. at least disseminating the idea in a really pervasive way of the importance of good citizenship. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. Ukraine has become an example of that in so mm -hmm. many ways. Yeah. Uh, a sterling example. Let's... Um, Let's talk about the work you do. I mean, you've both made such extraordinary contributions uh, to the world of journalism. Uh, Arlie is one of really the nation's leading sociologists. Uh, Adam, uh, as both a journalist and a historian, has few equals. Um, and you've had this marriage. I don't know how much you edit each other or how much you even oh, yeah. uh, you approach won't. working collaboratively. Oh. Um, but uh, let's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I've always been fascinated with how that works, so maybe I could ask each of you in seriatim to talk about how it works, and Arlie, it obviously does work, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. I mean, I really lucked out <laughs> uh, early in life. Can I be presumptuous enough to say so did he? <laughs> <laughs> uh, to find Adam and to click um, in so many different ways so seamlessly, uh, it's just something we're both grateful for. <laughs> um, and I don't know, I, our conversation daily is uh, about each other's work that day on that chapter. It's like we kind of uh, alternate. And I think uh, we read each other's stuff. Uh, I think... Uh, you read Strangers Four. Three, times. three times. Three, three okay. times, yeah. You know, but with, uh, and he, his red pen will make little jokes and uh, kid me out of um, phrases. I remember for the managed heart, uh, he, he has this red pen and on the side of it, um, I had an awkward phrase in an early draft. Um, shroud of salient uh, ambiguity. Okay, you can see why it's gone. Um, <laughs> and he, in this little note, he drew a little cloud and pointed to it, salient <laughs> you know, sailing off. <laughs> you know. And somehow, um, the laugh and the love you're left with, but this phrase is gone, you know. Whereas what she will write on my manuscript <laughs> is, and she read twice the manuscript of my last book, Re Rebel Cinderella, she'll write things. What is she feeling here? <laughs> when, <laughs> and of course, because she's used to interviewing people and where you can really probe and ask them, what are you feeling and why? I have the disadvantage that most of the people I write about have been dead for 50 or 100 years. <laughs> but... I, I always do, do feel that if she were able to um, 
asked them, it would have elicited far more than I ever could have. Yeah. Uh, and this last book, uh, Rebel Cinderella, is about this doomed marriage between uh, two very different people, a, a, a very, very poor Jewish immigrant and an extremely um, wealthy wasp socialite. And I think in the acknowledgments, I said that uh, if Arlie could have counseled them, they would still be married <laughs> instead of <laughs> having a very stormy divorce. <laughs> Well, I have to tell you... I thought uh, you were a little a, hard on Graham, actually, yeah. as I recall. As a sidebar, that uh, m my wife edits a lot of my work, and sometimes the red pen reminds me of blood. Um, <laughs> and I used to tell my students when I taught English composition that, um, uh, that I had used a red pen, but then I decided to go to a green pen because green is the color of, you know, stop, go, green is go, and mm -hmm. green is money, and green is environmental, and all that. And, um, <laughs> Think about a green pen, maybe. Okay. <laughs> but what, what, uh, where do ideas come from? Like, wh wh what got you interested in your last book uh, and Rose Passage? Uh, well, you know, they come from different things for me. Um, in the case of, of Rebel Cinderella, it was a photograph. Uh, I had been doing some work in the Hoover Archives at Stanford when I was writing the book on R Russia, and I came across a photograph of the American delegates to a meeting uh, in 1922 of the Communist International in Moscow. Here were the American delegates. And here was this woman named Rose Pastor Stokes, a very striking looking woman with a very Jewish face and this extremely wasp last name. And I knew the Stokes family was very prominent in New York society, tied to the Phelps Dodge mining fortune and to various other business enterprises. I wonder, could she be related to that family? I, I, was, I was so struck by this that I actually made a photocopy of the photograph, put it aside, then I got distracted writing a couple of other books, and then when I was searching around for a topic uh, uh, five or six years ago, I saw a mention of this name, uh, which was the first time I'd thought about it in years, in a history book uh, about the early 20th century. I thought, who was that person? And then I discovered this extraordinary s story. And as is often the case with things I write about, I'm far from the first person to discover it, but nobody has noticed it for a while. Uh, at the time that Rose Pastor Stokes was alive and very much in the pu public eye, between 1918 and 1921, she was the woman whose name appeared most frequently in American newspapers. <laughs> they did a count at the time, and if you go to a newspaper database today, you'll find this, that same thing is true. There were half a dozen men like Woodrow Wilson and Henry Ford and so on whose names appeared more often, but she was the woman most mentioned because people were fascinated by this rags and riches marriage, you know. And also an immigrant and a real yeah. American in the archetypal and, sense. And a Jew and a Gentile, which yeah. in 1905 when they married was so unusual that the combination of that and uh, extremely rich and extremely poor, that the marriage was literally front page news in the New York Times. So I got fascinated by this and just wondered what their lives were like. And happily, there was an abundant record to work from. They saved all of their letters. They wrote dueling memoirs mm -hmm. and she kept a diary. So do historians a favor and keep yeah. diaries, <laughs> save your letters. It gives us material to, rich material to work from. But I would have to say, it's interesting how he noticed this thing. Other, I mean, just looking at a photograph and there's this woman with a feather hat and a funny name and he, it stuck with him and he's like that. A lot of his books kind of do begin with just noticing things. Sometimes um, it's just like fiction it, writers will talk about, you know, that's my yeah. field, was my field for many years, just an image yeah. Yeah. that strikes them. Faulkner talked about a young girl in a pear tree with um, muddy underpants and that was Caddy Compson and The yeah. Sound and the Fury uh, uh, and uh, suddenly the whole story supposedly yeah. came out of that. 
Let's talk about the genesis of Second Shift, though. Now you get more interested in a question or an idea, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's true, but I'm also thinking of his um, his uh, book on the Congo, uh, King Leopold's Ghost. He it was a footnote. Yeah. You happened in that, <laughs> that this whole book just came from a footnote. Which, you yeah, know, just a footnote yeah. that referred to eight or ten million died during King Leopold's conquest of the Congo, and I thought, why don't I know that? when I've been to Africa half a dozen times as a journalist and was in the middle of writing a book about South Africa at that time, and that led me to the story. But with you, I think it tends to be more a question, like why do these people in Louisiana, the most polluted state in the country, go for a kind of politics that's so alien to their self-interest, the mm. Tea Party Hates oh. regulating the yeah. ballooners. Yeah. yeah. Well, that was the question that motivated you or was a catalyst for you? I was scared, actually. Just um, the, what m motivated me was just news of the Tea Party. And uh, this was already in 2011. I, I thought, uh-oh, something's brewing here and it's, it's going to stop all of our good works. Uh, so it was just uh, apprehension, and then. Uh, so fear uh, motivated you too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and what motivated you to write Second Shift? I was getting to that because I also wanted to ask you what you have seen change as a result of women and work with respect to the pandemic, because in some ways it's been you know cataclysmic uh, for women who had to stay home and be educators. The expectation again on them carrying the onus and the burden of teaching? Yeah, well, uh, I think uh, when I wrote uh, this book came out in 1989, um, and I did the interviewing uh, of factory workers and others uh, in the, uh, starting in the 70s. So, uh, and at that point, what was happening was male wages were going down uh, and uh, women were flooding the market to keep up those, the family uh, uh, wages. And what happened was women were changing, but nothing else was changing. The man that they came home to hadn't changed his idea of manhood. The work, the job she went out to hadn't changed any structure, there's no family-friendly policies. And I called it a stalled revolution and worked out kind of how, how couples did or didn't handle that and what might be the solutions. And that actually the family became the shock absorber of that stall of that. And what's happened now, I think, is it's gone through two other moments. We've had an exit, existential shakeup, both in the world of marriage and in the world of work. I mean, much has changed. Both of those have gotten less steady. And then a third moment with COVID, everything you're anxious about, you got more anxious about. You know, is your kid gonna have to take a year of school over again? Were they, were their social world so curtailed that they're really not thriving? Are you worried about them? Can you do your job? Can you do your job at home? What happens when you quit your job and the budget goes down? Every, everything you worry about, people worry about a lot more. It's put a lot of strain on the family. Getting back to what I asked Adam to pick up from that strain on the family, um, do you envisage things possibly moving toward more awareness of progressive politics and more acceptance of the necessity of progressive politics, particularly given uh, the disaffection that presently exists for Biden's presidency? I mean, the numbers are up a little after this recent State of the Union, but. Everybody's predicting uh, disaster for the Democrats with the midterms. 
Okay, Adam, you do that one. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't want to sound like Cassandra here, but yeah. you know, yeah. the, the spirit um, of the question is, what do you see maybe hopeful on the horizon? Uh, I'm um, not very optimistic in the short term, but I am optimistic in the long term because of these things that I mentioned before that are on the table now that weren't before. I also think that you know, we should be very proud of what's going on here in California. Uh, you know, this state is so far ahead of the rest of the country in terms of energy use, where the energy comes from. The majority of electricity is now generated from uh, uh, non-carbon sources in California. Um, and if I can boast a little, yeah. you know, our son, who is chair of the State Energy well, Commission, <laughs> has something to do with this. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, you know, states and cities can be laboratories in showing that things can be done. I do really worry, though, that even putting aside the polls, the public opinion, our political system is so clogged, so sclerotic, that it is, it makes it hard for shifts in public opinion in a progressive direct direction to get translated into action. You know, there's so many aspects of the Constitution that now in the 21st century seem absurd. The fact that every state has two senators, you know, California, you know, which is the size of, of many European countries has two senators. Wyoming, which has less than a million people, has two senators. There's such a bias built in to how the Senate is constituted. There is still no legislation or near-term hope of legislation against gerrymandering. Uh, all of this, of course, also affects how the electoral votes are counted. The very fact of the electoral vote system is an absurdity. Um, I really worry about all this baggage that we're, structural baggage, that is going to make it so hard to, to change. I think those are things we need to work on, not to mention the way that the Supreme Court has gutted the Voting Rights Act and has made uh, mere active voting a much more difficult and risky thing in many parts of the U.S. today. What I would add to what Adam is saying is that um, uh, if you're looking for good news, I, I think there is uh, good news in um, um, in the women's movement, the gay rights movement, uh, uh, black power, Black Lives Matter. Those were things that, uh, if you go back years, we really have made a lot of uh, progress on. What we need to do and haven't done, I think, is to make cross class alliances. I think social class gets lost uh, both on the left with various movements. We chop up people differently without looking at class. And the right, it forgets class because it's only focused on individual effort, individualism, and never mind class. So, uh, and I think labor unions used to be what connected a lot of uh, blue collar workers to the Democratic Party, and that's down to 9% the private sector. So we need new structures that, that illuminate those, those connections. A lot of um, get the Democrats people back that way. feel that the way is through unionization to do what you're suggesting or somehow bringing classes there's a lot of alienation between classes now, and uh, we always come back to the central question of how things are moving, and they're moving in a kind of tide where the Democrats are often seen as the elitist party now, mm -hmm. and the Republican Party is seen as the party of the common man and that's woman, right. that's and the proletariat, and you know, it's just the antithesis of what for so many years had been ingrained in American politics. So it's, it's maybe fluid, maybe, in fact, Ukraine will bring us together <laughs> Uh, in ways that we had never anticipated. It certainly caused changes that we would have never anticipated already. Who would have thought Germany would be sending military yeah. weapons or Switzerland would not be neutral? I mean, there's so many things that are really yeah. remarkable. 
What is, though, I remember W.E.B. Du Bois saying, I don't remember, I wasn't here at the time, but you know, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. But there's also the argument that the, the ongoing problem of the 21st century is the problem of class. Um, and I wonder how you two assess that very, it seems to me, vital question of what looms more in terms of American civilization and the future of democracy, class or race? Mm. Both. <laughs> Both. Uh, but you know, I saw something um, just uh, yesterday. I think I'm following a, a Facebook page, a very right-wing group in Appalachia, and uh, that sent people to Washington uh, on January 6th and so on. And I'm reading through it, and uh, I noticed that someone has posted uh, a quote from Eugene Debs. Oh, you told me about that. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. At saying... Um, People may not know Debs was a socialist leader back yeah. in the day, way, way back when. Yeah. So the, here's this right-wing uh, Trumpist <laughs> group with its Facebook uh, page, and on it is a quote from Eugene Debs. And it, actually, I thought, well, this is good. This is good. And what it was was a quote saying, look, the working man doesn't declare these wars. You know, it's the working man who's fighting them and dying and giving his blood for these. So let's think about class. But, and there were a lot of answers to this. So I thought there is a way of getting uh, 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 reconnected um, if we're focusing on um, what are class uh, issues and bringing race into it. You know, I just discovered the origin of the word um, redneck. I had always thought well, you're working in the fields and so you have a redneck. No, um, if I, I've read it in a book and also heard it from some of my interviews, um, that are now in Appalachia. And the origin was there was in um, uh, 1921 a big um, battle um, waged uh, between a coal company and its workers. And the workers were black and white together. And if you were on the union side, you wore a red kerchief and blacks and whites wore them. So uh, you, were, you were fighting with, with the union. The issues were pay and that you didn't have to be paid in script so that you pay the, the objects you bought, the food were company provided, so it was making a profit on you. Um, many other issues too, um, but it was a black and white together, so what a paradox that redneck is now used by snobby elitists to talk about um, working class people. Yeah, it is paradoxical. Um, where does um, labor in all this, Anna? Oh. Well, I think certainly what's happened in the world of work and the way work is organized these days uh, makes it much harder to organize labor unions in the way that um, uh, happened 50 or 100 years ago. Uh, work is atomized. A lot of people are working from home. Uh, work is increasingly mechanized. Workers are being replaced by machines. Um, I, I actually would recommend a, a, a very good new book, which I just read uh, and have just reviewed, uh, American Made by Faraz Stock Stockman, who is a reporter for the New York Times, who is black, but as she was interviewing workers in an Indianapolis ball bearing factory that closed, she began to realize that the story was really more about class than about race. This was a factory that closed a few years ago, moved its operations to Mexico because the company discovered that workers could be paid one sixteenth as much in Mexico as they were being paid in the United States. 
and still use the same machinery to make the ball bearings. Um, in circumstances like that, traditional labor organizing becomes very difficult. I'm heartened when we see signs of it taking place in the service industry, like uh, Star Starbucks and attempts to organize it at Amazon. Uh, the companies are resisting all out. Uh, they resist now by hiring uh, union avoidance consultants who are very savvy in social media and so on. This is much more genteel than uh, used to happen a hundred years ago in a period I've just finished writing about where, you know, you brought in armies of thugs. Uh, the Pickard and the Detectives workers. and the Union Busters. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, so it's tough for labor to organize these days, but I do think um, new ways have to be found, and I'm encouraged that it's happening in these places where we thought it wouldn't happen. Aren't you working on something now in 1917 and 1921 and seeing a lot of analogies to, uh, well, Trumpism and anti-immigration and censorship? And Yeah, this is a book that will be published in October with uh, a title that Arlie gave me, uh, American Midnight. Mm -hmm. She's much better at thinking of titles than, mm -hmm. than I am. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's about the United States in exactly those years, 1917 to 21. Uh, you know, normally when you read an American history book in high school, there's a chapter on the First World War, the doughboys in those forest ranger hats go over to Europe, fight bravely, win the war, come home, ticker tape parades, and you turn the page and the next chapter is the 1920s, prohibition, speakeasies, Al Capone, all of that. Flappers. I'm interested in these years in between, which were very, very brutal ones. Um, more people killed in racial violence between 1917 and 1921 than at any time since the end of slavery. Uh, I think 1917 was called the Red Summer because 1919 it was, so many was the Red Summer, mm -hmm. but the first 1919 was the Red Summer, but the first outbreak was in 1917 in East St. Louis, Illinois, and then. Uh, 1921 was the uh, Tulsa massacre in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where possibly as many as 300 black people were killed. Uh, there was also tremendous violence, uh, hostility to immigrants, uh, very Trump-like language blasting immigrants and refugees, which culminated in the 1924 immigration bill that basically slammed the country's door uh, on new arrivals for the next 40 years. Um, there was press censorship on a huge scale, supposedly due to the First World War, but it continued for two and a half years after the war ended. More than 75 newspapers and magazines were shut down completely because of publishing critical things about the government. During this time also, more than a thousand Americans were sent to prison for a year or more and a much larger number for shorter periods of time solely because of things they had written or said. Even and in private. Even in, in one spectacular case, even in private, where an eavesdropping microphone was planted in a cobbler's shop in Kentucky, and three men were sent to prison for things that they had said to each other just in the earshot of that microphone. So, you know, I'm fascinated by periods like that that get tend to get left out of the standard history books. Um, and this particular time period is one that just reminds, should remind us all of how fragile democracy is. Mm -hmm. uh, something can take the lid off and unhinge it. In this case, it was US entry into the First World War in April 1917, which legitimated businesses' attempts to crush labor, white hostility to blacks who were moving north in the, in, the, in the Great Migration, the government's desire to crush the Socialist Party, to crush the industrial workers of the world. The war gave all these things the excuse to happen. So how do we get it back, though? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the big question. <laughs> good, good question. Uh, you know, again, as I say, I think some of these issues are on the table now in a way that they weren't five or ten years ago. 
uh, and I'm, I'm hopeful at that. The New York Times Magazine yesterday did a uh, full-length profile of, I hope I'm pronouncing her name rightly, Rashida Tlaib, the, the Muslim mm -hmm. congresswoman who's the only Palestinian American mm -hmm. in, in Congress. You know, there wouldn't have been a Palestinian American in Congress and there wouldn't have been a sympathetic profile in the New York Times Magazine five or 10 years ago. Well, since uh, you mentioned Talib, um, let me get back to asking you about your thoughts on uh, the woke movement. Sometimes it reminds me in its excesses of what we went through, the three of us in the 60s. I mean, I remember people walking with Mao's Red Book and all of those kinds of things. And, you know, it leavened off uh, mm -hmm. and there's some of the excesses that we're seeing in the woke movement, there's the hope that keeps being repeated that it may leaven off in a similar way. Do you see that? The, I, I don't quite get uh, hope being... That, that, that it'll be a leavening, that will, there will be... And uh, in, in what we see as extreme now perhaps will diminish and go through... Uh, I certainly hope it's, it's the extremities or extreme parts of it are going to diminish. Uh, um, but I do think things are on the table now that, that weren't. There are now a number of Democratic Congress, members of Congress who are willing to be critical of Israel. This was something that wasn't the case 10, 15 years ago. Um, so I think there's, I think that I do see some progress. I, I mourn the excesses when I see them, and you see them all the time, but I nonetheless feel that, you know, the fact that somebody like Bernie Sanders could attract mm -hmm. the attention mm -hmm. he did and, you know, come in second in the Democratic uh, primary and talking about Medicare for all and so on, that's a huge step forward for this country. Aren't there still the, the big battles, though, over voting rights? I mean, particularly when we're talking about the future of democracy and this dem fragile democracy. I'm very worried about the battles over voting rights, and we're not out of the woods on that by a long shot. Yeah. And this is something that matters a lot to us and always have. We were both civil rights workers in Mississippi in 1964. You were, and also we should mention um, they met at a Quaker camp, a Quaker work camp in Spanish Harlem, and obviously... Um, he was attracted to older women because Arlie was what <laughs> four years That's right. No. And still Three. is. Three. Yeah. yeah. No. Are, are you still? I'm not sure. Yeah. 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 Um, you were 17, I think. I was. Yeah. I was. Yeah. Can you talk about that? I mean, what drew you to each other? I had a different bur boyfriend at that point, but that didn't last very ah. long. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, a boyfriend who later became a monk, actually. Yeah. <laughs> literally, literally. That's literally. not a cause and effect. No. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> no. But this, this was, I mean, uh, God bless the American Friends Service Committee, yeah. the Quaker Social Service Organization, which had a week-long seminar in urban social change for students. And it was in Spanish Harlem, and they, we spent a week... Um, you know, visiting prisons and halfway houses and mental hospitals and hearing talks from people about all this stuff. And, you know, we were both curious about seeing a larger world, I think. Well, you both had, you know, extraordinary rich lives uh, and careers, uh, very rewarding careers. And have, as I said earlier, given us, your readers, and uh, those who have learned from you an immense amount. Um, and Arlie, what's next for you? Our, he's, he's going back to 1917 and 1921. Where are you going next? Uh, I'm, I'm uh, already where I'm going. My next project um, uh, is in Appalachia. And uh, I've done actually uh, three years of interviewing already, uh, but it got stopped by COVID. So I'm doing Zoom interviews, and uh, that is actually a, a working much better than I, I thought it, it could. And uh, I was, I, sometimes I just marvel at it. Some, uh, Adam says, I, I, my problem is I always spill the beans. And <laughs> so I, uh, I'm being a little vague here, but I'll just say that um, um, 
I am trying to make uh, that um, an empathy wall. I'm trying to look at how working class um, uh, whites, rural whites, do or don't make an empathy bridge to blacks and immigrants. And that's. Uh, I hear all these Kentucky voices coming out of her study <laughs> all day long on these Zoom calls. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember, uh, I think um, Adam was telling me about you're talking to people who, in some instances, live in these areas where there are no immigrants and there are no blacks, and yet they are afraid that the blacks and immigrants are going to take their jobs and <laughs> uproot them and everything. I mean, that's right. And actually, their lives are very similar to those of inner city blacks in, yeah. in many ways. In poverty, certainly. Uh, poverty, uh, family structure, being in prison, drugs. That, so there's a class story there. And when they have to leave um, because coal jobs are out, and they, they're like the immigrants, uh, you know? And they're uh, derided and have a hard time. Uh, in the cities, they leave uh, the holler <laughs> to the find good, good work. And so they're very like the people that they're most afraid of. She's I also marvel, though, at how you build empathy, and but even beyond that, trust, because you do, I mean, let's look at you as um, somebody from the Bay Area, they have all these associations with that initially, I mean, those are your roots now, and uh, Berkeley, Professor Emerita, uh, Emeritum from Berkeley, all those kinds of things type you and class you in their minds. So how <laughs> do you break through that? How do you get through those kind of barriers? Um... You know, it's not as hard as you'd think. It's not that hard uh, if if what you're offering a person is your interest, and that's really the deal. You're not pretending to be anybody else. You are from the other world, but um, and and if they get that. It, it, it's not that hard, actually. I'll usually begin with something a little, uh, I don't know, uh, break the icy. Like, I have this name, Hoax Shield. You know, well, how do you spell this? How many consonants are there in Hoax Shield? And people will stumble over the name. And I'll say, yeah, when I uh, first met my husband, I thought, what a sweetheart. Um, Man, what a hell of a last name. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a terrible speller. I don't know how this is going to work out. So I'll say something like that, and then it, it's humor. Know, take it from there. Yeah, humor. It's levity. Humor. But you know, um, there's a kind of uh, decency of a lot of these people. I remember interviewing Dave Eggers, and he was on the trail going to Trump rallies, and he said, a lot of these people are religious people, they're good people, they're family people, they're kind-hearted, you know, they want... And there's a disconnect. He said, you know, we talk about immigrants in cages, children and so forth. They don't make the connection. I mean, is that what you found? Yeah, of course, yeah. 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 And they're they yet empathy. strong, strong f faith in their lives and so forth. Um, and they want to do good, many of them, yeah. because they're believers. You know, there was a, uh, a very hardcore right uh, person. She, I think she chapter six in Strangers in Their Own Land. And... Um, uh, very Tea Party, very pro-Trump, and um, I uh, put it to her. I said, you know, is she very uh, big in the church? And uh, when I got into her car, I could hear the rattle of um, some uh, walnuts that she was bringing as a gift, and her trunk had... Um, plastic cups because there would be a fundraiser for our boys in Afghanistan. A lot of social doing like that. And um, um, she, uh, I said to her over lunch one time, you know, it, you have just as much empathy as I do, but we've got very different empathy maps. And I don't see blacks on your map. And she said, she's Pentecostal. And she said, oh, 
no, that's wrong. I, uh, there, didn't you see in our church, there was a picture of photos on the cork board of um, uh, little black children in our Pentecostal mission um, in um, Africa. And I said, yes, but isn't that because you want them to be Pentecostal? And you know what she said? You got me there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's funny, um, you're mentioning Africa brings me back to, um, unfortunately, because it's very much on my mind, to Ukraine. Um, I, I keep thinking about Conrad and uh, the heart of darkness. I keep thinking about, you know, the horror <laughs> that Kurtz talks about and so forth. Um, I mean, I, I wish there was some way to look at this other than the resilience and the remarkable courage of the, the Ukrainian people with some modicum or degree of hope, but um, it's pretty grim. Uh, and um, nevertheless, what I admire about both of you is you've looked at a lot of grim stuff. <laughs> um, and especially he does. Well, and, and you admire each other, which is also a wonderful thing to mm -hmm. see, especially after this many years of nuptial bliss. <laughs> my, my wife talks about wedded blitz, you know, as opposed to wedded bliss. Um, but you really have a very enduring and, and you have much to be proud of with two terrific sons. Um, talking about boasting about your son who was head of the Energy Commission. And uh, you come from, both of you, um, really good roots. Uh, I mean, Arlie has sung praises about her mother. Uh, deservedly so, and from what I've read, but her father was a well-known diplomat. Adam's father was very big in the world of mining, and um, uh, both of you seem to honor your family backgrounds and honor the families that you've created. And Adam is mining information. <laughs> yeah, he's still a miner, that's right. And you're using your diplomatic skills to get people to talk to you. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. You've taken the words, sort of the paraphrase, yeah. exactly what I was going to say. We're going to move to the audience now, though. The cards are coming up, and um, all I have to do, I guess, is... Ryan, thank you. Uh, questions for you from the audience, perhaps comments. Um, we'll see. Um, first question, what is a book you'd write together? <laughs> ah. I don't know. I, I, if I could transport you back to some of these folks a hundred years ago that I was writing about, you would get King Leopold to <laughs> spill the beans in a way that nobody ever did. Uh, I'm somehow attracted mostly to these subjects in the past. Um, we tried. Uh, we, we, we did, did one, write that one yeah, article yeah. together. We, we, uh, many years ago, we went underground, so to speak, uh, this was in the late 1960s, to Orange County, which was then the sort of headquarters of the right wing in the U.S., John which, it is, which it is no longer because no, it's been taken for over by... That was yeah, a big break yeah. when they... Yeah. Until so many immigrants Clinton. have moved in. And Arlie worked in a John Birch Society bookstore, and I went from house to house as a fuller brush man, and we put all this together in an article that we wrote. We stay at the King Kauai Garden Apartment. Yeah. That's the only the only thing we've actually we've, written together. Yeah. Oh, maybe but something down the line. Who knows? Maybe something. Have either of you had writing projects that didn't go as you wanted or expected? What, if anything, would you change about your published work? Oh, well, that's a wonderful face that you're. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, 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 yeah, writing pro there. Uh, I, my problem as a writer is not writer's block; it's subject matter block. It's getting the right subject matter to cohere for me, and it sometimes takes a long time. Uh, I once I'm going on a book, see the subject, see the terrain, see a way of telling the story. I love it. I can go all out and usually work fairly fairly quickly. But then it's like falling in love. You sort of 
then the, the love affair is over and you think, I'm never going to meet another subject that I'll fall in love with again. I'm a little bit at that point right now because the, the 1917 and 21 book is finished. Um, I'm having a great deal of trouble finding a subject for the next one. It's a place I've been in before. All of our friends are used to me moaning and groaning about the subject. It has sometimes taken me as long as two years between books to figure out what the next is going to be. Yeah, but any of those love affairs, as you look back on them, that mm -hmm. were presumably carry the metaphor consummated that you regret? <laughs> of the books that I've written? Yeah. No. I th that was the spirit of that question. Or is there anything you change? Nothing, nothing major. Uh, although I've rarely reread a published work of mine, book or article, without feeling it could be a little bit shorter. And I mm. try to remember that when I'm writing now. As I mentioned, Faulkner's The Son of the Fury before, you know, he never felt that he had really completed that novel. He went back and wrote an appendix 16 mm. years later and yeah. what happened to the characters. Yeah. But he felt he never got it right. And he yeah. felt that about most of his novels. Uh, Arlie, you have any of that? Any? I just take too long. I just, um, I'm a perseverator. Um, Adam will say, well, I leave little mouse droppings around the house, a little piece, scratch on piece of paper, a new idea, and just kind of, I, I get uh, wound up. I wish I would just write it and do it. I, f I feel I am a little the opposite of Adam in this. He, once he's got his project, he's on it. And um, I quickly get on it, but then, uh, wander a bit. So I wish it weren't like that. I'm not sure for topic that I'd change <laughs> the style. Well, this next question is begins, hi, Arlie. Uh, are there opportunities we can or should be taking to reach out to people with different political views? Are there two things you wish we could do more uh, to um, make connections with members of the right? Mm. Yeah. Um, you know, the last time I was uh, in uh, Lake Charles, Louisiana, where I did a lot of the interviewing, um, I, uh, a young man came with me. Uh, it was a PBS uh, crew that was doing uh, some re-interviews with people in the book. And uh, he was uh, a friend of Paul Solomon, who, who was... Uh, the head of that group. Anyway, this young man has started a something called the American Exchange Project, getting high school students in uh, the South to, on Google, get to know high school students uh, in the North, get the coast to come inland, the inland co coast. It's now scaled up to 22 states and uh, I'm on the board of this. I'm very excited uh, about it. David McCullough is the name of the guy. American Exchange Project, you can Google it. And uh, when Louisiana was hit by uh, three uh, hurricanes, one after another, some of the high school kids in the North wanted to come down and help um, you know, clean up of the mess. They then visit each other. So for, uh, and they don't start with politics. Uh, so they avoid it initially. It's just not a, on the agenda first. Yeah. Yeah. It, it emerges. But um, I think something like that I would like to see, or even a um, one year required service. And everybody does that together. Um, community building, or it can be in the schools, um, that uh, mixes and matches us. There, uh, so I would like to see that. Uh, and there is something called the Bridge Alliance, which has some 70 or 80 different organizations with funny names like High from the Other Side. <laughs> or um, uh, Living Room Conversations, our own uh, Joan Blades uh, has pioneered that. 
and I've done that in our home with some uh, Republicans. So there's a lot that can be done, but what we need are channels. I favor ones through the schools. I think that, that gets people early. And along with that program should be a, a civics lesson, how, to, how does politics work, and a guide in mediation, how do you talk? You know, uh, it's, it's an art, it should be part of our citizenship. We should stop throwing shame snowballs at each other indirectly through. Here, here. Um, and uh, if I'm some, some real people on the other side who are also worried about this problem. So I like the question very much. Yeah, thank you for these questions. I'll go to as many as we have time for. Here's one that could go to either one of you. Um, why is it that we on the moderate left are trying to find an empathetic view of the Trump right while the right could care less about the left's position? <laughs> I'll take that one, I guess. <laughs> All yours. <laughs> All yours, yeah. Um, It's true there is less outreach, but the answer is it's in our interest. It's in our interest. I do not believe that the left's anything we care about can move forward and leave half the country was 47%. Uh, the whole white blue collar class has moved from left to right uh, in our lifetimes. And I don't think we can just uh, write it off and say we don't need them or they're stupid or uh, let them come to us. I don't think we, I, I, it's not in our interest to be disinterested. That's what I think. Mm -hmm. This is again to you, Arlie, with emotions not only driving social discord and polarization, um, do you have any recommendations uh, for reform, specifically in education or institutional culture to improve public management of feelings? Mm. <laughs> um, that a little bit overlaps with the previous question. Yes, I does. would say the American um, uh, uh, Exchange Project is one kind of answer I'd like to scale up. Um, but there is, I think, a, a kind of a loss of uh, an idea of what it is to be a citizen. Does it, does it call for, um, does it call for civility? I think actually we need to build that civil floor before we can begin the tough negotiating on real issues. I mean, that floor is, is very precious. It's part of... How do you build civility, though? I mean, this is something I've wrestled with uh, you know, a lot. I think we have to look at some of the best models of it. And um, I gave a talk at um, a Southern Methodist University, University yeah. in Dallas, Texas. And there met an extraordinary woman who uh, talks about um, needing to, to develop um, the kind of the civility we're talking about. She's African-American, she's a minister. And uh, one thing, I said, how did you happen to get into this? Uh, you know, the, it, she, she calls it cultural intelligence. Mm -hmm. And she invited me, you're, you know, tell us about cultural intelligence. I said, how did you come up with a, a, that idea? And she said, well, um, I was, uh, she said, I'm from Oklahoma, and uh, I heard on CNN that there was uh, a, a University of Oklahoma fraternity uh, where all the frat brothers were in a bus and they began singing a racist song. You know, we won't, uh, you know, never will have uh, black uh, members in our fraternity. And it was one guy on the bus who had a cell phone, recorded it. 
And the next day, um, the members of that fraternity were asked to leave the University of Oklahoma. And the fraternity itself was closed down. And uh, everyone thought, well, OK, that solves that problem. This woman said, what have they learned? And what it, word got out that she didn't think that was a good way to handle that. That's not how you handle racism. What have they learned? And so the next thing she knew, the mother of one of the expelled boys asked her um, to, uh, I think they sent a plane for her to come, uh, go from Dallas uh, to uh, Oklahoma. And she got off the plane, and there were all of these expelled white, contrite, uh, con we don't know what they felt, but they were all in a row greeting her. And she's a little bit of a thing, and she went right up and she began to give a hug, one after another after another. They were all white, she was black. She said, I think we have some some conversation to have. <laughs> and, uh, and she said, actually, the, uh, it changed some of the lives of those boys. And the boy whose mother had asked her to come uh, is now uh, working in the inner city. He's a social worker. So Because she reached out. Yeah, she I mean that's really out. She didn't say, oh, "I'm waiting for you to come to me." You know, she she was the outreacher. And a powerful story, mm -hmm. and what a story to end on because we have unfortunately come to the end. And there's some great questions for you. Uh, maybe we'll have to do this again sometime. <laughs> uh, I mean, thank you both so much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you, audience. Yeah.